Okay. Hey, good afternoon. I'm Steve Garris, and I'm a professor in the Department of Command Leadership and Management. Uh, my department teaches the core courses to the resident students in strategic leadership and defense management, but I also teach electives in critical thinking and judgment, which is what brings me here and us together this afternoon. So my goal over the next 45 minutes is to hopefully provide a condensed glimpse of how we approach and teach critical thinking here at the War College. And hopefully in the process I give you some skills that you can take and use. We are, I'm gonna go fast because I have a lot of stuff I wanna talk about. I wanna try to leave some time at the end for questions. However, if you have a question or a disagreement or pushback or clarification anytime in the presentation, just go ahead and grab the mic and interrupt me and, and talk. I'm comfortable with that, but kind of raise your hand so I don't think it's my mother-in-law, okay? <laughs> All right, let's get started. So uh, let me start off with a case for you. So folks say, hey, you're a leadership guy. I'm an industrial and organizational psychologist by trade. What do you think are the key attributes of effective leadership? To which I respond, what I think doesn't matter. We've been studying this for over 100 years. And when it comes to Carlitz with effective leadership, it looks something like this. Extroversion, and I'm really talking about energy and assertiveness. So uh, Mike Phillips has a chance. Uh, conscientiousness, really that drive to achieve. And then, of course, cognitive ability. And the higher you up you go in organizations, the more that cognitive ability thing becomes important. Now, I've got some bad news for you. These things, to include the personality di dimensions, are generally inherited, and they are really stable in adulthood, which means if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, you want to buy this DVD, it's 20 bucks, you watch it for three hours, it'll raise your IQ by 20 points, don't buy it, because it's not going to work. But there's some good news, and the good news is this, is in addition to these attributes, there are things called competencies, which are learned skills and behaviors, and are oftentimes more predictive of effective leadership. So the two competencies that will often rise to the top are one, team building, which I'm not going to talk about today, but I can if you want to. And the second and most important is this thing called judgment. So you've had a day and a half, and you've seen what life is like for the faculty at the Army War College. I literally get to watch middle-aged national security professionals develop and articulate judgments all day long. I consider myself an expert at observing judgment, and it's quite a privilege for me. So I listen to students talk about what they would do in the Ukraine, or maybe how they feel about uh, changes to military compensation. Last couple years, we've been talking about Iran, and here's a judgment that I, that I heard the other day, and it's a doozy, right? Okay, it's a joke, because some of you are saying, oh yeah, I heard that in seminar this morning. No, it's supposed to be a joke. Um, that wouldn't even be the, the worst judgment I've heard in the last week at the Army War College. Now, let me be fair to you. So on most, day, most days, I have lunch at what some students kindly call the curmudgeon table. Of course, I sit there to provide youth and optimism, <laughs> all right? But we have some real talent there. Len Fullenkamp with the star of a PBS special just last week on D-Day. Uh, Bill Lord, who's sitting in here, one of the Pentagon's best experts. Uh, Ed Filiberti, probably the only living Neanderthal. Anyway. As I listen to the judgments of the faculty at the lunch table, myself included, I can't help but conclude, hey, you know what? This is something we all need to work on. And if what I see in letters to the editor or what I hear on talk radio or any indication of what the general American public is doing in the area of judgment, I think we can all work on this. A quick highlight, this is Dr. Andrew Hill, Harvard Business School PhD. We literally pay him to sit at the curmudgeon table to reduce the mean age by 11.6 years. <laughs> Notice he's not even eating. He's just looking at his watch. Four more minutes today and I can go. All right, so what do we know about judgment? Well, it's a cognitive process that leads to a decision. Book written on judgment several years ago by a, a, a guy named Noel Tichy and Warren Bennis, who some of you may have heard of. And the first thing they said was, judgment's the most important thing that leaders do. But the second thing, and the thing I'm going to try to come back to as I go through this, the judgments of leaders tend to fall into three domains. And those domains are, first, people who you hire, who you fire, who you put on the team, take off the team, who you decide to mentor, who you decide not to mentor. If you read any of the talent management literature, most, many people will assert that you need to spend 25 to 40% of your time on people in the people domain to be an effective leader. That's the first domain. Second, strategy, where are you going? Okay, so who's this right here? Clausewitz, yes, so you're at the Army War College and there is a, a requirement in law that every presenter have a picture of Clausewitz somewhere in their presentation. 
So when you go up today and say, did he have the Clausewitz picture of the dead Prussian general? It's right there. But I'm actually not talking about kind of the grand strategy that you've already been exposed to here. Within organizations, I'm really talking about all those decisions you make that lead to what should be your principal goal, sustainable competitive advantage. You want to win in the short term and the long term. So it's those decisions you make about what automation systems you're going to buy, what markets you're going to expand to, maybe some changes in your structure. That's the second domain. Third domain, crisis. What happens when things don't go away the way you think? Um, the Sandy Hook shootings, I would argue as somebody who studies judgment that we've spent tens and hundreds of millions of dollars in school districts across the country responding to this, and I'm not sure we put our critical thinking hat on as we did it. International issues. Here's uh, Secretary Hagel with then uh, General El Sisi. But some of the students that are literally sitting next to you in seminar in two weeks will be in combatant commands and on the joint staff in policy jobs and J5 jobs, and they will be formulating and making recommendations on security assistance. So in Egypt, for instance, we had the quasi-coup last summer. We started to pull back on our security assistance. Then General El Sisi went to see uh, Putin, and then we started bringing it back again, and then we ran into some more problems with Apache helicopters. All those decisions and judgments are happening like this, and the people that you're with this week are making the recommendations, and in many cases, making those decisions. I will also highlight to you, uh, General El Sisi, as the, as the Commandant noted yesterday, is a graduate of the War College. He also took my critical thinking elective. And the point there is, as you look around the seminars you're in, you never know where those international officers are going to end up. Now, it's not often that they, they become presidents, but who knows, right? Um, so the point is this, of course, that if we can develop our critical thinking skills, we will improve our judgment. Okay, so that begs the question, well, what's critical thinking? So at this point, I would, us I would usually say, Hey, folks, this isn't rocket science. And then a couple years ago, I was given a presentation at the Missile Defense Agency, right? So you know how this is going to end. And I said, folks, this isn't rocket science. And the three stars sitting in the back said, Steve, stop. We know how to do rocket science, and we suck at critical thinking. So I can't say that anymore. What I say is, hey, this isn't rocket science. In many cases, it's harder. And I'll explain that as we go through this. The first myth we need to dispel defining this is the word critical. So telling somebody they're an idiot and their ideas are stupid is not critical thinking, but I've worked for leaders who thought it was good leadership, as I'm sure some of you have. But the problem in defining critical thinking is that there are numerous disciplines that kind of have their finger in the pot. Obviously, it goes back to Aristotle and philosophy, psychology, education. There's a whole discipline called judgment and decision making. I'm passionate about behavioral economics. They're all adding to this kind of view of critical thinking, and you can never get one definition. So I'm going to put three of them up here and then highlight some commonalities. First of all, it's deliberate or purposeful. You don't sit on your back deck with a cigar and a glass of wine and do critical thinking. Normally, you're doing it in response to a project, a requirement, or a crisis. Second, there's obviously going to be an evaluation of evidence. And I've underlined this word skepticism and it's important for me to highlight to you that when I say skeptic, I'm not saying cynic. They are really, really different. When you see the word or think about the word skepticism, I want you to think of these two words. Systematic doubt. Okay? Systematic doubt. Critical thinkers apply systematic doubt to the complex problems that they face. And the third commonality... Of course, there's going to be self-awareness and reflection and asking yourself, hey, what do I bring to this problem? If you buy the whole left brain, right brain thing, you could argue that what makes this so hard is you need that kind of that rational, analytical side of your brain to work at the same time that you're trying to see things from a whole bunch of different perspectives, the right side of the brain, and it makes it difficult. Okay, so how do we develop this? Well, the first thing you need to do is create the need. So... Hopefully nobody in here has had to deal with a family member or a close friend who was an alcoholic. But if you did, you would probably agree with my assertion that they did not decide to address their alcoholism because you told them to. They decided to address their alcoholism because they internalized and said, this is something I'm going to fix. And why that matters for critical thinking is you have got to be committed to the outcomes or you are not going to persevere when it gets tough. Now, the good thing or the bad thing, depending on your perspective or angle, um, the students that come to the War College need very little convincing about this. They've spent 12 and 13 years deploying repeatedly, seeing people that they cared about and loved die. 
They'll do anything to improve their judgment and their critical thinking. So I don't have to work very hard at that. The second thing I would tell you to think about, my, if my assertion is correct, then you can't force people to become critical thinkers. So whether you're talking across the military, we spend a lot of time mentioning critical thinking, or even in America in general, well, we'll teach critical thinking skills. I've been doing this for a decade, and what I'll tell you is, if you don't want to be a better critical thinker, it's not going to matter how many classes you sit through. You really have to be passionate about it to persevere when you face these tough outcomes. I find myself laughing out loud, literally, several times a week, because I violate everything I teach. It just feels good to be stupid. And the point is, this is hard. I teach it, and I still can't help myself. All right, the second thing, you've got to learn the knowledge. I'm going to go through this very quickly today. And then you've got to do some self-awareness stuff. And the War College does a nice job of providing opportunities to the students to go and sit through and get 360 feedback and talk to psychologists and, and, and find out more about themselves. And hopefully their faculty instructors and faculty advisors, along with their peers, are doing the same. Finally, you've got to apply and practice in a structured environment. So what we espouse is we teach critical thinking on like day two in August for the students, and then we practice it in seminar throughout the rest of the year. What I will tell you is it's inconsistent. It's not only the skills of the faculty instructor, but it's kind of the atmosphere that develops in that seminar in terms of whether or not they're going to develop those critical thinking skills to the level we need them to. Because what often happens is the students graduate, they go out in the Army, and they say, I've got four or five of my students that took my elective in here. And I recommended that they take this, uh, this, this presentation, if you get what I, my drift and what I was trying to tell them. Um, and they write me an email back and they say, hey, I really liked all that critical thinking stuff. I learned a lot. But I'm now out in the Army or the Navy or the Air Force, and I'm working in this toxic environment where almost we go out of our way to do the opposite of critical thinking. So if you think about that, it, it, it's really a multi-level phenomenon. You can learn all the critical thinking skills and really work at this, but if you're working in a climate and culture that doesn't value it, you end up being more frustrated than if you had not learned the skills at all. So as leaders, we have to create this climate and this culture that values critical thinking. All right, so I have this thing here that says critical thinking is hard. Let me give you the Steve Garris view of why that is. My argument is that we've been hardwired by tens and hundreds of thousands of years of evolution to do the exact opposite of critical thinking. What do I mean by that? Well, we like to win. The caveman had said, ah, you guys go ahead and beat me back to the cave. I don't care. This thing ate them, OK? Their genes aren't in this room today. Now, why does that matter? Well, because if you're sitting at a high-level board meeting in your organization, or you're sitting up in seminar with the students, you can just see this. It becomes more important for the person to win the argument than to get the right answer. They want to win the argument, and getting the right answer is irrelevant. I'm telling you, you're hardwired that way. Second, we naturally protect our self-esteem. So humans generally are social animals. We care what other people think about us. So as we develop beliefs throughout our life, when we see information that confirms those beliefs, our dopamine reward pathways light up, and it feels good. When we see information that doesn't confirm our beliefs, that doesn't happen. We therefore spend most of our lives walking around and looking for information that confirms our perspectives. And that's a problem. We often forget, we think there's one brain up here. I would tell you, I would argue that there's four. There's a lizard brain and a, and a mammal brain and a primate brain and a human brain. And we think the human brain, the prefrontal cortex, is making all the decisions. But as my wife will tell you, the lizard brain, at least for me, makes a lot of decisions. It's all that stuff back here that's making a lot of decisions for you. OK, and we're hardwired that way. Third. We conserve energy. OK, not that kind of energy. I didn't know what picture to put up there, so I just put that one. But it's called the law of least effort, and it applies to more than just my two sons. We're lazy. We take shortcuts. I don't know. The evolutionary biologist would probably argue we're conserving our energy to go kill the mastodon or something along those lines. But it becomes a barrier to really persevering through and doing the critical thinking. And finally, we quickly categorize. It probably goes back to the fight or flight mechanism. But much like this guy up here that I talked about, you could see where the caveman who said, oh my gosh, a threat. I'm going to take a few minutes and try to understand this situation from their perspective. OK, they didn't make it back to the cave either. Those genes aren't in this room today. So my argument, of course, is that for tens and hundreds of thousands of years, this hard wiring served man well. But in the complex 21st century, of which you've probably talked about that for the last day and a half, 
This becomes a barrier to critical thinking. So what's my case? My case is there are some things that we are, cognitive ability, energy, goal orientation, and there are some things that we do, these competencies, team building and judgment. And if we can develop our critical thinking skills, we will improve our judgment, especially in the domains of people, strategy, and crisis, and become better leaders. And we are hardwired to do the exact opposite of that. Okay? Are you with me? Everybody's with me? All right, so how do we address this? Well, I developed this model about eight years ago. It's now part of the joint doctrine in the operational design handbook. Um, there's a couple things, and I'm going to use this kind of as an outline to walk through the rest of the presentation. But there's two things I need to highlight. First of all, there's arrows on here, um, but that's just because it's for the military. If I made this thing all balloons and clouds, the military wouldn't look at it. They want to know where to start and where to stop. But it's really not linear. You could start down here and think about implications and then look at points of view. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you understand these concepts. The second thing is that when you get to this point right here, requires critical thinking, 99% of the time, I want you to go right across the top of the model where you're thinking about where you're going to sit when you come in here or what you're going to have for lunch or what you're going to wear today. Just go right across the top of the model and make a decision. However, if you're going to redesign the nation's healthcare system, if you're going to change our immigration laws, uh, say you wake up one day and decide to do a preemptive war into the Middle East. I would tell you to come down here and do some of these things, okay? Um, so as a psychologist, we have some terms for this. This is often called intuition, heuristics-based decision-making. Um, we, we also call it automatic thinking. And down here, obviously, critical thinking or control thinking. So what's the difference between the two? A quick exercise. You're calling your spouse to see who's picking up the dog. How long do you prepare for that phone call? You don't. You're shaking your head, right? You just pick up the phone and call. Automatic. Okay? You get an email from the CEO of your organization saying, hey, call me to, make, uh, to discuss some comments you made. Are you doing the same thing? Are you picking up the phone? No. What's the first thing you're going to do? <laughs> what did I say? And then you're going to pick up the phone? No. What are you going to do? You're going to go find people who were at the meeting and say, what did I say? What do you think I said? You're going to prep for it. You're going to write out notes and outlines trying to figure out what's going on here. Now, that seems obvious to you, but here's the key. You say to yourself, yeah, but when I get that email, I know to stop and spend some time thinking. This red flag goes off in my brain, and I know to spend some time and do some controlled thinking. And I'm here to tell you that there's overwhelming research that says that is not always or even often true. What do I mean by that? Well, picture kind of a car battery in your brain, and the battery represents limited pull of mental energy. And you have three cables coming out, emotional, physical, and cognitive. And what the research shows is all three of those cables are pulling from that same limited pull of mental energy. So if you just had a fight with your kid, and you're sick, and you're refinancing your house, and you're moving your mother into a senior citizen home, and your boss is yelling at you, you are going to struggle to do controlled thinking. You are going to move across the top of that model as quickly as you can. There was some research done in the last couple of years where uh, actually an Army War College researcher went and talked to a bunch of generals and said, let me give you a situation. Your staff comes to you and say, we've done a lot of analysis and this is our recommendation. But you, the general, your intuition says the opposite, that you should do this. What do you do, general? One 100% of the generals said what? Intuition. They go with their gut. And I'm here to tell you, in a stable environment, that's okay. But in a complex changing environment, you are going to have problems. You are going to have problems. And you think that you can always go across the top of the model, and I'm telling you, you need to force yourself to go down and do critical thinking. Okay, so let's walk through some of these boxes, if not all of them. Um, clarify concern. Again, you don't have to start here, but I'm going to start here. And what I'm going to tell you in about 10 minutes is that egocentric thinking is probably the biggest barrier to critical thinking. But what I'll tell you, that I really kind of realization I've come to this year, this is the thing that we in the military are weakest at. That's what we're weakest at. What do I mean by that? So I had a uh, general from the Pentagon come to my seminar about 18 months ago. He'd been on the, in the Pentagon for five years. I said, hey, sir, What's the biggest problem you see in the Pentagon? Like this. 
He said, we don't take the time up front to think about the problem before we start making decisions and executing. It reminds me of this Einstein quote that probably many of you are familiar with about the five and the 55 minute rule. In the military especially, we almost reverse those around. And we think about it for five and we, and we go at it for 55. Now, I'll bet you there are some new members in here that are saying, well, that's what we need in our organization. We can't execute. And these military guys, they can execute. And that is true. But if you're executing in response to the wrong issue or in the wrong way, you're just making more problems for yourself than you already had. So you have to figure out that balance. And that really requires critical thinking. Uh, so what do I mean by clarify concern? Well, the argument is that we tend to spend most of our time getting to courses of action as quickly as possible and not spending the time right here in the middle on problem identification and construction. So the students, and you can talk to your, uh, your, your, your escorts or the people in some of they've had classes and theories presented into this year such as design theory. We force them and give them a methodology to spend the time thinking about the problem up front and not getting wrapped around these courses of action too quickly. And they can walk you through that if you have time up in seminar. The question we have to ask is, what problem am I trying to solve? And I will tell you, I've been here 10 years on the faculty. We teach this. I would not be surprised if the next decision I saw come down from the, the hires that be, and I know I'm on TV here, so this is a little risky. Half the people that received it didn't say, I'm not sure what problem we're trying to solve. We struggle with this at the War College where we teach this uh, to the same degree that we do in the military. And I think we're just hardwired with that performance orientation, which is a great strength of ours, not to spend the time thinking these, through these problems. And then communicating in many cases, hey, here's what we're trying to do here. So put the communication piece into the critical thinking toolkit also. Yes, ma'am, go ahead, please. When you teach first people, are you teaching the different aspects? No, ma'am. Uh, yes, I am. I'm just kidding you. Uh, yeah. Can I infer from that that you think there's a difference between men and women with critical thinking? I would agree or disagree with you except for one problem. We really have a hard time measuring this. There's measures out there. There are critical thinking things, that, uh, tests that you can take, but they're really specific. I've tr been working for years to try to develop a measure of critical thinking so I can see who and what kind of demographics maybe do it better or not. I don't know the answer. And I can't generalize from my experience here because how many women do I have in my seminar every year? One, maybe two. Um, and, and if they're in here, they're great critical thinkers, by the way. No. Um, so I, I, I'm not comfortable even going there. But there, it's hard to measure, and I think some aspects of this the research would support, and other aspects of this I can think where the research might push against it. But my overall answer is I don't think there's a lot of support saying one way or the other, mostly driven by the fact we don't really know how to measure this. We don't know how to measure this, okay? All right, so what problem am I trying to solve is the question you need to ask. And then the real difficult part, and the reason why I say this is something that we really struggle with in the military is this question. Am I addressing a symptom or the actual root cause? And what I tend to see, especially in government organizations, is we tend to address what the root cause produced rather than the root cause itself. And I think that's probably normal for hierarchical organizations, although I think if you have a profit and loss responsibility, you're going to be more inclined to drive backwards to figure out what the root causes are. We don't have that pressure as much in the military or in the federal government or state and local governments. And the reason why is we don't want to have these really uncomfortable discussions about what are some of the root causes to these issues. Military sexual assaults. You don't read in the paper, well, they had a conversation about who they're bringing in and kind of what their values were and how they're screening people. We're not going to have that conversation. I'll have it with you now because this is non-attribution. It's only going to be on the internet. I don't know if anybody watches that. But that's a discussion that we ought to have, and we kind of sometimes have it behind closed doors, but we don't have it outside of, uh, in, a, in a much larger audience. And you could pick any issue that we face in the military and as a nation, and I would tell you, we don't want to have uncomfortable discussions. Some of my European students do this much better than Americans do. They will have more candid conversations. Some of the other parts of the world are less inclined than Americans to have those uncomfortable conversations. And you can talk about that when you get back up in seminar. Okay, our point of view. So the thing on point of view is I'm not talking about your opinion, at least the way I, I frame this model. 
I'm talking about your frames of reference, or your dominant frames of reference. So what are frames of reference? They're the complex knowledge structures you form throughout your personal and professional life that affect the way you look at issues. So if I said to you, ma'am, what do you think about the Affordable Care Act? And you say, it stinks. I would say, no, that's your opinion. Your, your frame of reference is that you're a 41-year-old mother of nine, your father was a lawyer, your mother was in the circus, your son broke his leg in Germany and got good health care, and your cousin died because they couldn't get health care in Arizona. And all of that stuff is sitting in this suitcase. That's your frame of reference, and it affects the way you look at the issue. So as critical thinkers, you have to say, what about my life experiences affects the way I look at this issue? Okay, easy enough. And then you have to say, how about the person presenting me the information? What about their life experiences? What about who they are affects the way they're looking at the issue? And then what are the other relevant perspectives that I can empathize with so that I can more fully understand the issue? And you're nodding your head and you say, okay, it's really hard. So let me give you an example of one of my laugh out loud moments. So the issue is illegal immigration. I don't know why, probably because the way I was raised and my life experiences in the military and outside the military and raising my own kids, I tend to be a rule of law person. I, my view is don't ever reward stuff you don't want repeated or it's just going to repeat itself more and more. So I'm kind of a rule of law person. Take the illegal immigrants and send them back home because we don't want to reward that. And yeah, I understand that we need people who do who work in orchards and put up drywall and put up roofs. And I understand if you're in a border state, you probably have issues in your schools and your emergency rooms with, and so forth. And I understand all that, and I can empathize with that. I'm still a rule of law person. So it's May 14th, 2010. It's prom night in Carlisle. And we have this 22-minute hailstorm with these things coming at the southwest part of town at about 60 miles an hour. So every house in the southwest quadrant of town needs to get a new roof, to include me. So August 1st rolls around. It's about 90 degrees, and this club, club cab pickup truck shows up in the front of my house with Texas plates, and these six guys get out, and they're all from El Salvador. I know what you're thinking. Were they legal? They were. I said to the former, are these guys legal? He said, see. Anyway, <laughs> they start working on my roof and taking off the shingles, and then it's time about noon, it's 93 degrees to put the shingles up top here, kind of like these guys. And there's this one guy, he's about this tall, and his job is to put a pack of shingles on his back, go up the ladder off my deck, which is the shortest access to the roof, go up two stories and stack. And I'm watching him do this, and he's the only one doing it, and I start to feel bad for him, I'm going to go help him lift this, and I do one of these, and then if you ever lift a pack of shingles, I'm a little football player, it's incredibly heavy. This guy was sometimes taking two packs on his back at a time. And I had to have this epiphany. I'm like, you know, I've been teaching and talking about looking at things from multiple perspectives. Um, but being around this guy has changed my view on illegal immigration. Because I don't care what we do with illegal immigration, but we got to keep that guy around, right? Because if we're really about sustainable competitive advantage, we're going to win with people that work that hard. And we're probably not with people that don't work that hard. And then I thought, well, really, is that the deal, Steve? You have to personally experience things to understand them from all perspectives. Can you think of other examples of that? That didn't take long to do. Okay, so why does Senator McCain differ with his party on torture? Because he was tortured, right? He surely disagrees with this guy, but this guy disagrees with his party on what? Gay marriage, right? Why? Because his daughter wants to spend a life with somebody she loves. Fair and balanced. The president pushed back on the D.C. Teachers Union when Michelle Rhee was the uh, chancellor, harder than uh, most Democrats would have expected. And I don't know why, but it probably is like me. When you send your kids to school, you tend to look at the school systems differently. But the point is you can't possibly experience all of life's angles on these complex issues that we deal with at the strategic level. So you got to figure out ways to get that information. Go read stuff that you typically wouldn't. Travel. And what you probably have seen in the last day and a half, the great advantage we have here is the near 80 international officers who are sitting there and providing these different angles to not only enlighten the U.S. officers, but for the U.S. officers to give them our perspectives. That's important. All right, a quick metaphor for you. So it's the fourth quarter, and there's a close play on the, end zone, in the, on the, uh, the sideline. And what happens, these guys get together. Now, what are they doing? What are they doing? Somebody here watches football. They're talking about the play, right? 
I show this picture because people say, well, if I do all this looking at things from other perspectives, I won't appear like a decisive leader. Is there someone in this picture who's going to make a decision? Who? The guy in the white hat is going to make a decision. And what's he doing? He's listening to everybody tell their perspective of what they saw. He might go over and look at the instant replay where he literally looks at every angle of the play. My question to you is, why does he do that? So he can make the right decision. Looking at it from multiple angles so he can make the right decision. Now here's the key thing, and I really want you to listen here. So this guy, the, the, uh, the head ref here, he called the guy out of bounds. And he talked to his, uh, the umps, and two said he was out, and two said he was, was in. And then he went and looked at the, uh, the angles from the TV camera, and the first two were ambiguous. He couldn't tell. And on the third one, he realized he was wrong. And he called him out, but he's actually in bounds. Now, here's my question to you. What did it feel like to be wrong? What did it feel like? And here's the answer, and this is important. It feels like being right. So right up until the moment where he saw that the guy's toes were in bounds, he was sure he was right, because that's what it feels like to be wrong. So as critical thinkers, you have to have the intellectual humility to say, I'm really pretty sure I'm right on this, but I know that when I'm wrong, I feel the same way. And I'm going to be reflective and self-aware and think, you know what, I think there's overwhelming evidence that supports my case, but I know what we can do. We can argue about it for an hour, or we can pick up an iPad and Google it, and in four seconds find the answer on Wikipedia. And we're laughing, sort of, but that's what you need to do. That's what you need to do, because what does it feel like to be wrong? It feels like being right. All right. So I mentioned before that this is the biggest barrier to critical thinking, egocentrism. What are we talking about here? Well, first of all, I have the arrow going into point of view, but in reality, it affects all aspects of this model. Um, in terms of definitions, again, I have three, because that's my number. Of course, there's the self-serving part. There's the inability to empathize. But the last one's the real critical one, this belief that you figured out how the world works and your view is correct. Because the, 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 the military officers that are in these seminars with you were picked from the top 5 or 6 or 7% of their cohort. They've been selected early for a command. They're going to go into command from here. They are very talented officers. And it's easy for them, and I was a retired officer, and I, so I kind of commiserate with it, to think, well, I wouldn't have been selected if my judgment was all messed up. So I think I figured how the world works, and my view is correct. And as a person who observes judgment, I can tell you that becomes problematic. All right, so what kind of manifestations does it lead to? Some dispositions. I only remember stuff that supports my view. I'm narrow. My way's the right way. And then I don't even see stuff that doesn't align with my view. And you can sit in the back of seminar, and when somebody's telling you something that is completely opposite your perspective, you almost watch their nonverbals turn off. And you go, oh, that's not a good thing, because you're going to be leading here, making a really important decision, and you're not going to hear information you need to hear. Now, oftentimes I'm asked the question, hey, Steve, what's the relationship between critical thinking and IQ, okay, so my picture of Einstein. So I'm going to relay to you a, a study that was done, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this half of the room, and I'm going to tell you that you guys are brilliant, all right, I've sorted you, and you're brilliant, and you guys are not sitting on this side, if you get the gist, okay? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick an issue, and let's say illegal immigration, and I want you to write down your position on illegal immigration, I don't want you to do this, and then I want you to write all the reasons that you support your position, and when you're done with that, I want you to write all the reasons against your position. And guess what we're going to find when we're done? You guys over here will have an overwhelmingly larger number of reasons supporting whatever position you have than you guys. But when it comes to reasons against your position, they're about equal. So what happens to this group? You become really confident in your views. Because you can think of all these reasons that support your position and not that many against it. And that overconfidence, especially at the national security level, and there's a long history of this from McNamara to Rumsfeld, becomes problematic. So you've got to be self-aware and think about that. All right, so some more on egocentrism. U.S. News and World Survey, hey, if you sue someone and you win the case, should he pay your legal costs? Okay, what, what percent of respondents said yes? Call it out. 100%, 85%, right? Pretty close. Same survey, same question, six questions later. Hey, you sue someone and you lose the case. Should you pay his costs? Now, what should those numbers be? 
the same. What's this number going to be? 44%. Why? We just changed the angle that you're looking at the issue. So if you think you're going into meetings and that self-serving part of you is not causing some biases in the way you look at the issue, you are kidding yourself. Another thing related to uh, egocentrism, is, egocentrism is this thing called the endowment effect. The endowment effect says that when you own something, well, it, whether it be tickets to a, you know, an NBA playoff game or a nice house or maybe a fancy car like this 71 Pinto, you tend to fall in love with it more than you should. You have a hard time letting it go. You put it in the paper for $12,000 and the first offer comes in at $300. That's a normal human concept. But it's not only in regards to material things, it also applies to ideas. So when you develop beliefs, you tend to fall in love with them more than you should and you have a hard time letting them go. And you can see it in seminar. I know I fought this through. If I'm wrong on this, my whole worldview is dorked up. So I'm going to hang on to this baby forever. And it's all happening in the more primitive parts of your brain and you don't even know it. Another study for you. Okay. So you're all equal now in terms of IQ. What I do is I say, everybody bring in your favorite recipe. And then I take the recipe and I give it to the panel one of those TV food shows. And I come back to this half of the auditorium and I say, the panel thinks your recipe is spectacular but they think you should, take, you should add a teaspoon of sugar. And to you, I say, the panel thinks your recipe is spectacular, but you should take away a teaspoon of sugar. And then I give you all a survey, and I say, what did you think of the feedback? Half of this group is going to like the feedback, and half is not. Who's going to like it? These guys. Why? I'm adding to the idea that they love their favorite recipe. And you guys, I'm pulling a little bit away. So when you go to meetings and somebody says, well, it's a great project you've been working on for six months, great recommendations, let's double it. All the dopamine is getting fired. If we say, great work, so we're going to do about half of that, it doesn't work that way. And as critical thinkers, you're self-aware of that, and you understand the endowment effect. All right, quick sort of aside. So ever since I've done this presentation, I've showed this picture of the 71 Pinto. I went to high school with my friend Stan's he had a light blue Pinto, and we drove to it to school every day, and it is the worst car I've ever been in in my life, okay? Um, and I, people kind of give me a little chuckle. Well, Carlisle, as some of you may know, is the car show capital of the Northeast. The first week of June, much like this weekend, we always have something called the All Ford Nationals. In 2011, as part of the All Ford Nationals, we had the 40th anniversary you know it, of the Ford Pinto, to include a Pinto parade. Right there's the car I went to high school in. Okay, so I'm standing in the middle of uh, Hanover Avenue, and off to my right are a group of car owners, and they're having one of these We Are Penn State shouting matches, and one side is yelling, Pinto! And the other side is yelling, Bobcat! Now, I see some people in this room who know what I'm talking about. They go back that far. Why are they yelling, Bobcat? The Mercury version of the Pinto. So I'm standing here and I thought, my God, I just talked to the NSS new members three days ago about the endowment effect. I'm going to walk over to this group and explain to them that just because, much like me, you got your first kiss in 1975 in the back of this Pinto, it doesn't mean you have to hold on to the car for 40 years. I'm also going to tell them something about the Ford Pinto that everybody knows apparently except for them, which is what? It blows up. The gas tank is in the headrest, you morons. So I start walking over to tell them that, and I did a reverse step march when I saw this. They know it. They know it, okay? And that's really funny, except it's the same problem with ideas. And when I see students going at it and they're not changing their minds, I just look out and go, kaboom, kaboom. You're not letting it go. That's the endowment effect. All right. I'm going to move very fast now. So assumptions and inferences, two more clouds. I could spend an hour talking about how we, we fail to change our underlying assumptions in life, but I'm instead going to do a quick diagram that says, you have a stimulus, you make a quick inference like that, and the inference is based on your underlying assumptions that you've developed throughout your life. Picture the stuff in those suitcases. Here's the issue. You think everybody in the room is making the same inference you are, which obviously implies that they all have the same worldviews and assumptions as you, and that's not true. 
Critical thinkers realize that people make different assumptions because they have different underlying assumptions for how the world works. So a quick exercise. You're at an important briefing and you see several misspelled words. Quick, what's your inference? Call it out. The presenter is dumb. What else? Lack of attention to detail. What else? Doesn't care. They're in a hurry, right? Think about that. Those are different inferences. Those are different inferences. I put up, you know, the ones that you usually hear. They're dumb because you have an underlying assumption that smart people spell well. Is that a good assumption? It's actually not. But remember, what are your judgments about? People, strategy, and crisis. So uh, you're sitting there watching this person. You're thinking, misspellings, dumb person. I'm going to give them a bad performance appraisal because smart people spell well. It's actually not necessarily true. Are they in a hurry? And you can look at those assumptions and say, are those true? The key is, as critical thinkers, you understand that you're always making inferences. You oftentimes make them just in response to nonverbal behaviors, and you think everybody's making the same inference, and they're not, because they have different underlying assumptions and different life experiences, and you're, you're aware of that. Okay. Um, so now, I could spend six hours talking about this, but I'm going to do it in two minutes, and just tell you, if you really want to learn more about it, just Google Garris critical thinking, and the first thing that will come up will be a paper that will walk you through these in maybe four or five sentences per fallacy or per bias. Um, but before I talk to those, I want to talk um, some other things to th consider when you evaluate information. And the first is the credibility of the source. Is the source credible? Now, I'm going to save you all a lot of time and tell you a shortcut. How do you know quickly whether a source is credible? They agree with you. Oh, you're laughing, but that's what you do. If they don't agree with you, what do you say? Oh, that guy used to work at Lehman Brothers. He didn't deploy to Iraq. And you start coming up with these rationalizations for why they're not credible. Be sensitive to that. If they agree with you, you think they're credible. Second, what I would tell you is figure out the underlying assumptions that drive your life or your organization. Develop testable hypotheses to confirm that they're true. Figure out experiments or look on Google Scholar or look back historically to see if there's some support for that. And then if you are wrong, change your worldviews. And that is so easy to say, and it's very, very hard to do. But you have to get that information and evaluate it, and then be willing to alter your perspectives on life. All right, so the two things I'm going to quickly talk about, heuristics and biases, logical fallacies. So a heuristic's a rule of thumb. It's a shortcut. We do them all the time. We have to. If you misapply a heuristic, however, it's called a cognitive bias. And at the strategic level, it can lead to really, really problematic decisions. The good news is that these biases tend to fall into three areas. Availability, representative, and anchoring and adjustment. So availability history. If I remember it, it must happen a lot. So it's time to go into Iraq, and I can think of Kosovo. It was just the Air Force and Afghanistan, a couple of Special Forces guys on horses and some B-52s. Let's go in light. Kaboom, right? Kaboom. I remembered it must happen a lot. Now, switch that around a lot and think about your discussions up in seminar. Are we going to go somewhere now after years and years in Iraq and Afghanistan that we probably should go into? Think about Rwanda back in 94. We're not going. Why? Well, I can, when I think about a U.S. intervention, it didn't work out that well, so it must happen a lot. It's not true. Representative, all I'll say is General McCaffrey up here telling you these really powerful, funny anecdotes and you think that defines the phenomenon. It doesn't. It's a sample size of one. Critical thinkers are aware of that. And finally, anchoring and adjustment. You're always going to get anchored to the first thing you see or the first information presented to you. That's not a problem. The problem is that you don't properly adjust from that. You have to adjust from that. All right, I'm really crunched for time here. Um, moving from biases and heuristics to logical fallacies, there's obviously 20 or 30 of these. It goes back to Aristotle. These are the nine that I put on my model. But what the students do is what I call the trifecta of logical fallacies. And it goes like this. It starts with a false dichotomy. We either do this or this is going to happen. And the this is going to happen is almost always an appeal to fear that rhymes with nuclear Armageddon. Okay? And then they look down and they look back up and they see if they've got you. And if they don't, they come in with a grand slam of weak analogies and it looks just like this. They say, it'll be like Vietnam. And once they say that, the conversation's over. Now, this is a true story. I said this exact trifecta thing for the first time last year in the NSS week. We went up to seminar at 1330, and we started talking about Iran. And the first student said, we either bomb Iran or Iran gets the bomb. 
And I had about four or five new members, and they all looked to the back of the room where I'm sitting, and they're like, did you plant that? And then somebody says, and not only that, but think about Syria. Although if we go into Syria, it'll be like Vietnam. And all the new members are like, that's bull. There's, you told those guys. I said, no, they do it on the road, man. They do this on the road. It happens every year. Okay, so you have to know these logical fallacies, and you look for them, and you're sensitive to them. Finally, you look for implications. Uh, very quickly, the one word I want to highlight, inevitable. We think things are second and third order effects or unintended consequences, and oftentimes, if we'd have just thought about it, we'd have realized it was happening. Um, no Child Left Behind, 2004, everybody's got to be proficient or almost really above average. I was in a fellowship that year with education, and I thought, boy, if I'm a really talented teacher in an urban school or real rural school, I know I'm not going to get my students there. It's going to be really hard. What's going to happen? People are going to cheat. So when they cheat, what did we say? Well, it was an unintended consequence. So critical thinker, I would say no. It was inevitable. You just had to think about it. Finally, oh, so you tend to think through the consequences that you can read that. I'm not even going to try to read it to you. It's, it happens with logical fallacies also. If the, if the, if the fallacy supports your perspective, you don't notice it. Um, finally, you go up here and you make a decision, and hopefully you get some feedback. Were my assumptions correct? Did I really understand what the root issue is? And that's the critical thinking model in 46 minutes. I, will, I owe you questions uh, for two or three minutes, and you guys will still get up because the other people have to walk across the street. So with that, what are your questions? Any questions? Yes, ma'am. You know, so here's my kind of epiphany on this one, and you're going to disagree with me, I know, but for some reason it seems to me when the higher being or God put into people the intellectual and moral courage to disagree and apply critical thinking, he used a turkey baster, and when he sucked it open, he pulled out all emotional and social intelligence. So for some reason, the people that have the courage to stick, they don't have the social intelligence to know how to do it in a way that is productive. It's the curmudgeon in the corner saying, oh, that's a stupid idea. We did that 10 years ago. As opposed to, hey, I can see a lot of benefit with that, but I think we should talk about some, some challenges that, you know, it just doesn't, they don't go together as much as they should. So we spend time here talking about social intelligence. We have lessons in self-awareness, but I really think that's what it takes. It takes the social savvy to know when and how to present the results of your critical thinking. And my experience is, it doesn't, they don't align very well. Whether or not you agree or disagree with Matt, um, I don't know, but I'm right. Yeah, please. <laughs> okay, so I talked about automatic versus controlled. Does the army understand that dichotomy? You betcha. So what do we do with our soldiers to prepare them to go to war? We train them and train them and train them because what do we want them to do? We want them at 3 o'clock in the morning at 8,000 feet in Afghanistan in an ambush to go right across the top. We don't want you to, to think about anything. We train you and 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 you get to the strategic level, what's your default? right across the top. And I'm here to say, and this whole war college year is to say, you got to pull back. You got to move to the balcony. You got to take the time to look at these issues. Well, I don't have the time to do it. Probably true. So here's what I would recommend to you. Get everybody in your organization to develop reasonably strong critical thinking skills. So by the time you see it, it's been through a bunch of filters and you know good thinking has already been applied to it. That way you can save yourself time. But your observation is completely correct. It describes the tactical environment. But more so, the tactical environment is looking a lot like this also. Ask your students about the complex situations they were in as even captains and majors in OIF 1, 2, 3, and 4 in Afghanistan. Yeah, last question. Go ahead.
Yeah, so, yeah, I think that's a great question. So the way I have presented inference in this model, it's really more the subconscious inference. It's happening like this and you're not thinking about it. You can also say an inference is just drawing a conclusion from the facts presented to you. Um, I don't even have a term for that in the model other than evaluate information. But that's a very fair question. I see it as the, the unconscious inference, the thing that I see the students are doing this all the time and they think that everybody's making the unconscious inference they are and they're not. What you, but inference is also, obviously also defined as drawing a conclusion from information. Um, that's really this box right here. So hopefully that helps. I hope that clarifies it a little. I am required to get you back up to seminar. Hey, thanks for coming. I will stay up here for questions. Email me if you have any. Thanks. <laughs>